As I thought a lot about this and I've spoken to different people, I've kind of thought that one of the real hardcore questions that people might not say out loud, but they say to themselves is, how does this affect me? You know, if you say, well, there's an island that's going to melt, people go, oh, that's very bad, they're going to have sea level rising, and you say, oh, in Australia they're going to have more wildfires, and people go, oh, that's very bad. But a lot of people thinking, but how does it affect me? As long as I'm okay, and I can do what I'm doing, and so it'll be a little hotter. So the question is, um, the question is, in the next 10 years, in the next 20 years, in the next 30 years, a lot of us have children. If you're saying that occasionally there won't be almonds in the store, a lot of us are okay. But if you're saying something much, much more serious, then that's different. So the real connection, the reason people don't smoke is because they know that 30 years later they can be a problem. The reason parents are, want their kids to study is because they, 15 years later they're going to have to get a job and they want them to get into college. But somehow there's not a connection being made about what's happening now and what'll be, it'll, how it'll affect them in 10 years, 20, 30, and 40. So is it possible to make a connection and say, listen carefully, in 40 years from today, this is what's going to be different about your life? Because, and it's possible to even do that less than 40 years, like 30? Because it seems like that's what people want to know. How are they going to be affected in 10 years, in 20, and 30, and 40? Well, I could maybe go first. The reason that people eventually stop smoking, when I first entered medical school in 56, we knew then that smoking caused cancer. And some of my colleagues were smoking then because it was sort of sexy, but they stopped soon after. But it took us many, many years to convince people to stop smoking because the tobacco companies were cl very clever. Their propaganda was, well, it's, it's doubtful. It's like the sceptics. Mm -hmm. We don't really know. And they'd go to the pubs, because most Australian men drink beer in the pubs, and say, so we're not really sure about smoking. And it worked until finally the medical evidence was so acute that people stop. And now in Australia we have uh, cigarette packs that don't have labels on. They've got pictures of people dying of lung cancer, pictures of lungs full of cancer, pictures of people who've had tracheostomies and holes in their neck, etc. People still buy them, those who are addicted, but it's really had a huge influence and that's going to take place now in England. They're going to have those sort of plain packaging for cigarettes. So it was a process of education and in medicine, if you, you have to educate your patient. If you tell a patient they've got leukaemia or Hodgkin's disease, you have to explain what it really is, what the pathology is in lay language, and then what the treatments are and what the side effects are, so the patient is part of the solution. It's education. Similarly, with global warming, it has to be education, and we're way behind the eight ball with this, way behind, partly because the oil companies, Exxon and Shell and uh, coal companies, They've got a huge propaganda campaign going to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars. And they've got various think tanks in Washington who come on television and propound, you know, it's not really happening and the like and the like, men in their suits and their ties, very official. Often the think tanks are staffed by similar, the same people. So they sort of interdigitate and vary. So there's a huge propaganda campaign going and that's why there's this scepticism, although the science is absolutely there. Therefore we've got to counter this and they've got lots of money and the people who really know, including the International Panel on Climate Change, don't have much money to educate people. Therefore I would say that it's imperative that we teach people about this as we've tried to teach people about the medical dangers of nuclear power and nuclear war. And in the 80s, we were successful. When I first came, I'm just going to go a little bit. When I first came here in 78, almost every American I spoke to said it's better to be dead than red. And I thought, you'd rather have a nuclear war? Yeah, we don't want to be communists. And I thought, these people are psychotic. <laughs> they were. 
split between reality and perception of reality. So I organised physicians for social responsibility, 32,000 doctors, 23,000. And we started teaching people what happens if a bomb drops on their city. They get vaporised. Uh, they turn into missiles travelling at 100 miles an hour, sucked out of buildings and the like. I'll go into that tomorrow if you want to come in here. And gradually people started to say nuclear war is bad for our health. And even the annual morticians wanted me to come and talk to them about they didn't want to have to embalm radioactive bodies. And I said, don't worry, you'll be one yourself. And they passed a resolution against it. So in five years, by education and getting on the media, because the media is determining the fate of the earth, that's how you educate people. Mr. and Mrs. Joe Sixpack out there, you know, with their babies and everything. If they know, then the politicians respond. And 80% of people became opposed to nuclear war. And I met with Reagan, I'll tell you that tomorrow. And, and we brought about the end of the Cold War with Gorbachev and Reagan. So education is the key. And only if people are educated do the politicians respond. And as Marshall McLuhan said, the media is the message. And the media is absolutely bereft of morality at the moment. All they want to do is sell their, you know, hemorrhoid cream and the stuff that, and, and erections, what do they call it? Erectile, <laughs> erectile dysfunction or something, what do they call it, you know? You know, and then they say, but the side effects are... <laughs> it's just ridiculous and, and okay. selling drugs to people, you know? I really resent that as a doctor because people don't know what the side effects are. So, therefore, we've got to get on the media and okay. I'm not sure how to do that. Okay, do you let's, know? Well, let's, let's talk about the Good. facts. And I appreciate you know, your great career of decades on, on nuclear and, and from the medical aspects. And, of course, you're right that there's a lot of disinformation and there is a lot of corporate money that, that's twisting the politics, both Australia and the United States. And you're absolutely Globally. right on that. But let's get down to the, the misunderstandings of the science are really pretty <coughs> profound. Most people, and I talk to very diverse audiences from, uh, uh, from communities and church groups to national security to ports to uh, not only in the United States, Europe and, and uh, Hong Kong. And the misunderstandings about something like global warming are really profound. Sea level is both the proof of climate change as the size of the ice sheets change uh, volume and move the sea level up and down. But for example, most people think that the melting polar ice cap around the North Pole adds to sea level rise. I don't know how many of you believe that or not, but I would say that in the general audience I talk to, probably 80 or 90 percent of the people think that the disappearance of the polar ice cap is why sea level is rising. It's not. They're like ice cubes in a glass. Our understanding of basic physics is really very profound. We do have to do a lot of education. You're absolutely right. But it's not just the disinformation about whether we should be using tar sands or coal or nuclear or solar or wind and all the energy questions that, that Seth's quite expert in. The fact is, we've assumed this planet was much more stable than, we, than it really is. The five or 10,000 years of climate stability that we've had, not weather variability, but climate stability <coughs> is really unusual in the planet's history. It may be a coincidence that the rise of human civilization about 5,000 years ago happens to have coincided with sea level stabilizing and climate stabilizing to that degree that sea level was static. Or maybe it's why we were able to develop so well as a culture and civilization. But the fact is most people don't believe that sea level could rise 212 feet when all the ice melts on the planet. And that it's now unstoppable that we are going to have at least tens of feet of sea level rise. We have a lot of basic education, to do. you're absolutely right. And we need to stay on this subject because it does affect everything from malaria in Seattle to uh, all the other things you, you very well articulated. And it does get to the energy issues that Seth, I'm sure, can enlighten us on. But we have a real challenge to get the facts about climate change and despite what people want to get us to say for disinformation, just like they do with cigarettes and cancer when I was a kid. But this is going to change everything. It's going to change the drinking water and the food supply and the disease vectors. And as we go from 7 billion people on this planet to 10 billion, even if we can reduce our energy consumption by 50% per person, 
we're going to be back at the starting point because we're going to have 50% more people. And the average person is using more energy. We do have to get educated. You're absolutely right. And I think we need to move the discussion forward to this issue, whether you call it climate disruption, which I actually like very much, global warming or climate change, doesn't matter. The fact is, after 5,000 years of stability, or maybe 10,000, everything's changing. And I only use sea level because it gets people's attention because it means real estate's going to move. Sea level is different that people think it's the same as storms, like a Hurricane Sandy. It's not. A storm hits a region, and within a day the water recedes and you can rebuild. Sea level won't recede for a thousand years. It's permanent flooding. It affects all the coastlines. It gets much further inland, up tidal rivers. We have a lot of education to do to ourselves before we teach others. And we've really got to get this right because to your question, Steve, the problem here is this is a slow change. It's like getting cancer from smoking cigarettes. You're right, good metaphor. But here the problem is that we're not going to see catastrophic sea level rise just to use that one effect for 20 or 30 years at the earliest. I mean, a little bit. Miami's already putting in pumps to keep salt water off the streets during King Tide days. In Miami Beach, they just put in $15 million of pumps. And other cities around the world are dealing with these nuisance flooding events every 28 days that you can predict with the high tide chart when we have an extreme or King Tide. So those effects are already happening. But it's just the beginning. It is the tip of the iceberg. No pun intended. Bad pun. Good pun. Good pun. Thank you. It's the tip of the iceberg and the iceberg's melting. But the fact is, we're going to get 10 feet of sea level rise. Every coastal community in the world within the next century or two is going to have to deal with this. We all have to learn the facts. We have to learn how to communicate it. I'm sure Seth's book looks great. Um, this is a modern problem. We didn't think this problem was possible 50 years ago to this magnitude. We did not think we could have an ice-free Arctic in the 21st century. We will. It's been frozen for 3 million years. Anybody that says, oh, it's happened before. I said, well, you must have a long memory. <laughs> this is different, and it's hard to put in perspective. It's a different time frame. Yeah, to get to uh, uh, Steve's question about why why aren't we more alarmed, uh, the people on the street? Why aren't they more alarmed? I think John hit the nail on the head. It's, it's easy to alarm someone about nuclear war because we can all envision tomorrow a bomb dropping and everyone dying, right? But climate disruption is a gradual process. It's, it's, it's darn scary, but it's not going to be darn scary tomorrow. It's going to be over the course of decades that these problems are going to happen. And there's, a, there's an old story about a boiling frog. Yeah. Of uh, If you have a pot of boiling water and you throw a frog into it, it'll jump out of the boiling water. But if you put a frog into room temperature water and you slowly bring it up to boiling, it'll just sit in there and cook. Because the change is gradual, it doesn't notice it. And that's sort of us. We are the boiling frogs right now. It's all changing around us right now. I mean. It, it, these changes have begun, as John mentioned, with sea level rise and all kinds of other things, increased uh, extreme weather all over the place. It's already happening, but it's gradual, and so we don't notice it. Uh, human psychology is such that we're not very good at analyzing a long-term risk. It's why people smoke, in fact. Mm -hmm. All those people who smoke know very well that they're much more likely to have heart attacks and cancer and everything else, but they do it anyway because it's in you know, 30 years that it's going to happen to them, or 40 years, and just as humans, we're really bad at assessing that type of risk. If it were going to happen tomorrow, they would stop smoking. And unfortunately, this is what we're faced with with climate disruption, is that's the time scale in front of us, the sort of decades when it's going to become truly catastrophic. Um, but we need to start doing something about it today. We can't wait, because changing our energy mix cannot be done overnight. It can't even be done in two years or five years or ten years. It takes a long time to change our energy mix. We need to start today. Occasionally, I see some stories that are quite shocking. Um, I heard someone say that in 2048, the oceans would be overfished. I keep reading stories about the term ocean acidification. I read something that yesterday, that something like in 15 years, 60% um, of the coral reefs could be dead. Um, and then I also heard someone say that in 2048, which is only 33 years from now, if you take the fish out of the ocean, they said something I didn't really understand, how the fish interact in a way 
that keeps the ocean alive and the ocean produces oxygen. And all of a sudden I was thinking, well, what does that mean? Does that mean, so again, between all these different terms, between the dead zones in the ocean, the ocean acidification, the overfishing, the dying coral reefs, the increase in temperature, the increase in storms, the animal extinction, overpopulation, I guess, how should we be thinking about this? In other words, in other words what is the hierarchy of what really should be on our minds? And what, again, is the time frame? Are you saying that we should, I mean, in other words, there's a woman who says that in 10 years from now, an MIT scientist, says that in 10 years from now, half the children are going to be born with autism. Now, that's very shocking. Born that makes what? There's a woman from MIT who said that in 10 years, all children, half, I'm sorry, I didn't say that, half the children born would have autism, right. half the children. So I don't know if that's accurate, but that was a woman from MIT said that. No. So I'm saying, let's, what, what is the hierarchy of what you see is the first things that, we should be, that we're going to be seeing that will affect us in sort of the time frames to get out of distortion into what really seems like the way things could turn out? Well, it's a great question. And uh, I don't think there's a simple answer. But this is an ocean planet. We tend to forget it because we live on the land portion generally. But it's not just the 72% by surface area. It's 98% of the biosphere. That the, because of the oceans are an average two miles deep, you know, compared to the couple hundred feet of forest canopy on land, that the 98% the of the ecosystem is, is in the ocean. And the phytoplankton, which does make about half our oxygen, is something, the microalgae, we can't even see. It's got more biomass than the trees. It's out of sight, out of mind. And you mentioned ocean acidification, and that's great because it's a really important concept. And I don't know how many of you, how many of the audience have heard of ocean acidification? I'd be curious. Well, a little more than half. It's the pH. I don't know if you remember from school, but pH goes from 1 to 14 from acid to alkaline, and fresh water is neutral in the middle at 7. The oceans are alkaline, and they've been very stable at 8.15. But they're now down 8.1. That's a 30% increase in acidity because it's a logarithmic scale. To keep it simple though, that plants are um, dependent upon the, the alkalinity of the soils. Roses and things like that grow or don't grow because of the acidity. What's happening in the oceans is really profound. The ocean food chain is changing. Corals may not grow well. Shellfish are already having problem in the Pacific Northwest. The uh, oysters aren't aggregating. The, shell, the calcium of the shell can't aggregate because of a simple chemistry issue. The oceans are going to change, and the whole food chain is changing in the oceans. That's really profound stuff. It comes from the same reason that we're warming, because carbon dioxide, which we're putting in the atmosphere, and used to be in a range of 180 to 280 parts per million, and is now at 400 parts per million and climbing straight up. Carbon dioxide has been going like this, and now it's about here. And the problem is that that carbon dioxide traps heat, greenhouse gas, but the other thing is it dissolves in the ocean, it turns into carbonic acid. That's what's making it. So the both causes of warming, destabilizing the, the normal temperature regime in the, uh, that we're used to, and then the acidification both come from too much carbon dioxide, from fossil fuels, from liberating that. That's right. In fact, many more things are coming from that, too. Almost every problem you listed in your question is driven by our emission of, uh, our burning of fossil fuels, putting greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. That's what's causing ocean acidification. Uh, the, to, the back story there is the reason the ocean is getting acidic is the carbon dioxide we put in the air, some of it dissolves in the water. And carbon dioxide plus water makes carbonic acid. It's basic chemistry, so we're making it more acidic. Uh, which causes all of these problems, killing coral reefs and shellfish and everything else. Um, so it's, but it's our burning of fossil fuels that is doing that. It's also what's increasing the global temperature, which is what's causing the extreme weather, the droughts, the extra wildfires, the flooding, the extreme precipitation events, the stronger hurricanes. All of these problems, almost everything you listed, is caused by one thing, our emission of fossil, our burning of fossil fuels and the emission of carbon dioxide. And of course, if you haven't, if you haven't heard it, methane, which it, there's about 30 greenhouse gases. The biggest one we put in the atmosphere is carbon dioxide intentionally by burning fossil fuels, as Helen said. But if you haven't heard about it, methane is an even bigger potential problem. Methane is hundreds of times more potent as a greenhouse gas, but there's much less of it. But it comes out 
it depends, it deteriorates to CO2. It depends upon the time frame. It's either 86 times over uh, 20 years or 32 times more potent over a century. But when methane comes out of the ground, it's hundreds of times more potent than carbon dioxide at trapping heat. The problem is that we don't intentionally put methane in the air. It's basically natural gas. But as we drill with fracking, that's another problem with fracking, that escaped natural gas if it's unburnt goes in the atmosphere as methane. But when we put it in trucks and things like that, which is basically good because it's cleaner than other fuel sources of petroleum, but any leakage gets into the atmosphere. But the big potential for methane is something we have no control over. As the planet warms, methane comes out of the permafrost in the Arctic regions. It comes out of the seabed. There's something called methane clathrates or hydrates that are, it's like a slush just beneath the ocean bottom. And as the planet warms, that destabilizes and transforms from slush to methane. And it's now bubbling out of the ocean. And we can't, st we can't control it because it's a simple function of warming. And it's probably, I don't know about Seth thinks about it, but it, for me, it's the scariest unknown because we can't quantify it and the IPCC just says we can't quantify it, so that kind of leaves it out. Well, they're starting to look at it now. They look at it, but they can't quantify it, so it's not in any of the equations. Um, I, I don't agree that you can't uh, get people to concentrate on this, because when I first started talking about nuclear war, everyone thought I was mad. And, and, the, poli and the media said, what are doctors talking about this for? Th this is a political issue. And we said, no, it's actually a medical issue. And this is a medical issue too, so if you bring it down to people's lives and their children that they love, who are going to live another 50 or 60 or 70 years, who will inherit what we've done, then you can get them to concentrate and understand. These issues are complex but need to be boiled down in a simplified language that people can understand. Um, I think methane's interesting because cows, well, to use a word we don't usually use, fart, methane. <laughs> and there's a scientific um, organisation in Australia who worked out that if, if you collected the methane from two cows over a year, they could power a single house with everything it needs because methane is used and can be used for electricity and the like. That's kind of funny, but everyone or most people here eat meat. So you've got millions of cows and chooks, you call them chickens. Not, not in this audience. All right, you don't. I'm, I'm generalising the Americans like to eat meat. So we've got chooks, which we call, you call chickens, pigs, cows, sheep, all producing methane. And the permafrost, of course, is really scary. Um, I want to address a couple of other issues. Overpopulation. The way we can stop overpopulation, and we've known it for a long time, is to educate the women of the world and provide them with contraceptives. And then they stop having babies, or only have, you know, two. And so it's really time, and don't tell me we don't have the money. We've got a huge amount of money in the world, but it's all allocated to the really rich who get richer and richer and are addicted to wealth, except when they die, they realise they've probably done the wrong thing. So. The solutions are all here, but it's the priorities that are wrong. And I'd just say one other thing, that the Earth is like a human body. The ozone is like the skin that protects us from the ultraviolet light from the sun. In Australia, the ozone is really thin, and we've got a very high incidence of malignant melanoma, one in nine, and a very high incidence of skin cancer in Australia. Uh, the atmosphere is a temperature control mechanism which is located in the midbrain and brainstem. And if you get a tumour there, you can die from the temperature just going out of control. Then the, the, the lungs are the trees of the earth because they inhale carbon dioxide and excrete oxygen which we breathe. And therefore they're essential in what we're doing. I mean, I even look at toilet paper in, in my bathroom here. There are two rolls of toilet paper. Everyone uses it, you know. But how many trees are we chopping down to wipe our bottoms? In India, they don't use toilet paper. They use water. 
and wash themselves and it's really very clean. That's just one example, and I'm not saying you have to do that, but newspapers, I mean, paper napkins, you don't need paper napkins. I use my handkerchief. Don't blow your nose on trees, blow your nose on a handkerchief. Everything we, and paper towels in the kitchen, think about the fact that you, you're blowing your nose or using the lungs of the earth for these trivial pursuits. Then the, the water supplies, the oceans and the rivers, they're the blood supply, the circulation of the world. And then the rocks and etc. are the skeleton. And in a human body, if we've got a person in the intensive care unit, we might stabilise the electrolytes, the cardiac function, the liver function, and then one thing, like getting an infection or something else, will destabilise the whole system. And they in, the systems intersect together so the patient goes into cardiac failure, renal failure, etc., and then they die. And the planet is like that. It's so delicate, and we don't know a lot about it. We know some, but it's, we can compare it to a human body. Okay, that's a great metaphor and, and very interesting. I may use parts of that, but let's think of this realistically. We've got seven billion people. Even everybody stops using toilet paper and does all the other things you've suggested. Oh, that's only a trivial No, I, I understand that, but let's be realistic here. That it's seven billion <laughs> headed to 10, and with the average person using more energy, and that that heating being the cause of the ocean acidification and the climate destabilization, we come down to, in spite of all, all the good efforts we should do with population education or birth control, and I agree with that, but we can also chart out that the graphs don't work, that over our lifetimes, over the next 20 years, even if we do all the things we should, this problem is unfortunately going to get worse. We need to do two things very seriously. We need to adapt to a changing climate and not fool ourselves into thinking we can stop the change, but then also try hard as hell to slow the warming. Those are two very different thoughts, and in fact, they seem like they're diametrically proposed, but they're not, and they're just reality. The fact is, even if we stop all fossil fuels today, 100%, if we could go 100% solar now and keep CO2 at 402 parts per million, where it is today, we're still going to have sea level rise. We're still going to have the disease changes. We're still going to have the change in agriculture, the droughts. The ocean currents already changed. You can't put this toothpaste back in the tube once it's been squeezed out. So we need to do two things and keep it very clear, in spite of all the nice metaphors, the fact is we have locked in a fair amount of climate destabilization. It's unfortunate if we can go back and 30 or 40 years ago and have listened and maybe gotten off fossil fuels, we could have fixed this. It's like the patient who's now smoked, uh, you know, a thousand packs of cigarettes. You can't take that out of their lungs. Thank you. And the fact is that we've got to begin to adapt to a changing climate. The governments of the world are now agreed to try and keep global warming to two degrees Celsius, that's 3.6 Fahrenheit, to try and keep it to that. And they don't know how to do that. And very few scientists believe it's doable. Two degrees Celsius, three and a half degrees roughly Fahrenheit is a huge global temperature increase. The difference between now and the last ice age is 9 degrees Fahrenheit or 5 degrees Celsius as a global average change since the ice age. We are on path for catastrophically different climate which will affect agriculture, disease vectors, uh, everything. We've got to wake up to that. We've got to ad begin adapting and we've also got to do everything we can to slow the warming. Now that everybody's really scared. Uh, okay. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> so, uh, yes, the, we have 400 ppm CO2 in our atmosphere now. Parts per and, million. Part, yeah, parts per million, that's ppm. Uh, the last time Earth had 400 ppm was about 3 million years ago. It's actually older than the entire record in the, in the ice cores in Antarctica, which go back hundreds of thousands of years and show cycles uh, never getting above really 300 ppm, and now we're at 400. Um, and so you can actually look back and see what our climate was like when 
the atmosphere had 400 ppm uh, carbon dioxide in it, and it, it wasn't anything like our planet is today. It was a very different place and not very hospitable to human society. Um, that's true, but it, we're talking about time scales here. We're at 400 ppm today, but the planet doesn't change like that. It's going to take a long time for, the, for that heat to get distributed around and to, to change our climate um, to be like it had been a long time ago. So yes, uh, no matter what we do, we have a major problem in front of us, but what we need to do is to buy ourselves time. And there are ways, conceivably, technologically, to, for example, get carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, carbon sequestration concepts. Now, those technologies are a long way from being ready today. But they're, they're decades off, but what we need to do is to buy ourselves that time. We need to wean ourselves off fossil fuels as fast as possible. I, I get worried when I hear uh, uh, a diatribe, if you will, like that, because, it, I mean, it is really scary, but it's e very easy to get scared into paralysis and just say it's hopeless. Um, and if we say it's hopeless, then we're definitely, we're all screwed, right? We need to do something. And so, yes, we're gonna have to adapt. We're gonna have to build seawalls around some of our cities to keep out the rising sea level. And we're gonna have to uh, move people away from coastlines and uh, you know, deal with the water shortages. They're gonna happen with the increased droughts and everything else. We're gonna have to do all that no matter what, even if we, fit, if we changed our energy mix today, like John said. But that doesn't mean we don't start changing our energy mix because if we don't, it's gonna get a hell of a lot worse, a hell of a lot sooner. Absolutely true, and, and, and when, I, when I talk to different audiences, uh, and I, I don't give up hope, and I've got a 14-year-old daughter, and I live with it every day about what is the future and how to make this a positive message. And we all need to do that. You're absolutely right, because it's easy to kind of just tr turn this into something, uh, you know, it's fatalistic, and it's too late, and so on. And that's not true. It's like going to your doctor and being told you have a serious illness like a cancer. The fact is, 50 years ago, cancer was a death sentence. Today, it's rarely a death sentence because we have technology, we've, we've, we've applied ourselves to it. We said we're going to tackle this problem. We can do the same thing with the part of climate change that's already locked in. We can build cities higher. We can evacuate other cities over the next decades. This is a problem that we have decades to adapt to. We can also do things like Seth said, and work to either reduce CO2 emissions in the, our, um, as we produce fuels or even find ways to get CO2 out of the atmosphere, but it'll take decades. Okay, so the trouble is that because of the American media and outreach and Madison Avenue, most people in the world have television now and most people want to live like the Americans. You think Mozart wrote by candlelight. I'm not saying we go back to candlelight, but people did survive without electricity. I bought a camera the other day. I had to plug it in. Normally, cameras didn't need electricity. The way we use electricity is really obscene. Americans waste 28% of the energy they use. They waste. Leave the lights on. You know, uh, it's quite extraordinary. And so people around the world are starting to emulate that. If Americans stopped wasting electricity, you wouldn't need nuclear power because nuclear power provides 20% of the electricity you use. You waste 28%. If you hung your clothes outside to dry in the sun, you know, there are lots of ways to stop wasting. So I, I think very seriously that if this country doesn't change, which has become the model for all other countries of the world because of your advertising outreach in Hollywood and the like, we're doomed. So it comes back really to what this country is going to do. Um, and I disagree that we can't fix it. Here's Australia. We're bathed in sun. We're mostly desert. We've got a hell of a lot of wind. If we put solar panels on every single building, on all the parking lots, and we had solar-powered cars, electric cars, that we plugged in and then plugged them in at night into the house, we would not need fossil fuel to have transportation, and everyone would become energy independent, and the GDP would go up, um, 
the unemployment would stop because so many people would be making so I mean that's what you should be doing here your car companies you call, call them autos in Detroit if you started making solar panels to cover the whole of America all the buildings with solar panels it would be fantastic and we know that solar is becoming cheaper and cheaper by the day. You've got enough wind west of the Mississippi to supply three times the amount of electricity you currently use. Three times. But you have to upgrade your grid. You need a smart grid. But it's so exciting. So you can serve. You can use... And, and Australia should become the energy superpower of the world and show the rest of the world how to live. The reason it's not happening is our blasted politicians are owned hook, line and sinker by the oil and the fossil fuel companies and the nuclear companies, you know, because it costs so much to get elected. Okay, but, but listen, um, and, and by the way, Helen is, has been an icon. I, I grew up with my mom adoring some of the books and articles you wrote as a leader about nuclear power. 40 years ago, 50 years ago, and it really deserves a lot of credit. But let's be realistic here. You don't want us to use nuclear energy, okay, no. at all. You want us to go 100% so solar and do all these other things. Let's just say we and did that. Wind Let, and tidal. Uh, excuse me, Helen, just yeah. one second. Yeah. I complimented you, okay? That just, <laughs> that just, that assuming we did that, let's assume she, we did exactly what she prescribed, wrote by candlelight, you know, and did no, all this. No, I didn't I, prescribe I, I, that. I, okay. That we, that we went 100% solar. Even if we did that, the planet is already one and a half degrees Fahrenheit warmer. The ice will continue to melt. Sea walls will not keep water out of Miami. It's porous limestone, as are other coral-based islands. The water is just going to come up under the seawall. Okay, we have some harsh realities, okay? Yeah, but okay, we can okay. slow it. We, we can slow it, but let's not fool ourselves into thinking it's going to make the problem go away. Because the more we slow it, the better. You're right. And some people, just to throw a little controversy in here, would think that nuclear should still be on the table. Now, I'm not saying whether it should or not. I, I'm not saying whether it should or not. But you have to decide how aggressively we want to slow the warming. But also how we're going to deal with the effects that are already locked in, that are in the pipeline. And that's really what I'm asking us to consider. There is no easy answer here. You're right. And we must not make it depressing so we shut down. <laughs> it's not. No, I, I really believe that. We have decades to deal with this, but we've got to do two things. We've got to adapt to the climate change, which is locked in. Even if we went 100% solar today and kept it at 400 parts per million, that's 40% more CO2 than, ever, than in the last 10 million years. And as Seth said, the last time we had 400 parts per million of CO2, the planet was about two degrees warmer and sea level was 75 feet higher. So we've got to disabuse ourselves of thinking that the answer is just solar. And I mean just solar. I didn't say no, just I didn't solar. No, I, didn't, I, I didn't, said wind, tidal, I didn't, conservation. Okay, if we did all of those things, we are still going to get big disruptions. We need to approach this realistically for our kids and grandkids and the generations beyond. This is not just about what we can see in the next 10 years. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk more about this in my, uh, in my lecture tomorrow, but there's really three things that um, we need to look at. There, basically, we have three options. There's uh, adaptation, which you're arguing we have to do no matter what, and I totally agree with that. We have to do some adaptation because we're stuck with what the mistakes we've made already. There's uh, mitigation which is what Helen alluded to, uh, alluded to, which is changing our energy mix. And we absolutely have to do that. If we don't do that, we're all, we're we're all, we're all, we're all yeah, we're all screwed. Um, and then the, the, the third option that's, I guess, on the table is what's called geoengineering, which is using the Earth as a laboratory to either uh, uh, come up with ways to, on a global scale, reflect more sunlight away so that we don't warm up, or to take CO2 out of the atmosphere on a, on a global scale. And there are all kinds of ideas out there on ways to do this, you know, making micro bubbles in the ocean to make it more reflective so more sunlight will reflect off the ocean. All, uh, countless other examples, putting aerosols in the sky. And maybe some of those would even work, um, but I'll bet you they'll have a dozen uh, unintended consequences that may end up being worse than the problem they were trying to solve in the first place. I don't want to use the earth as a laboratory. I think that's a bad idea. So we've got adaptation and we've got mitigation. I'm throwing out geoengineering. Let's hope we don't have yeah, to do that. Yeah. 
Uh, and so basically, I, you're, you're, you guys are arguing those two points, and not, one is not more important than the yeah, other. We have to do both of them. I'd like to, so I'll use a medical analogy again. It's a patient who has cancer and has metastases. Right. But in fact, through chemotherapy and radiation therapy, we've stabilized, and the cancer, the patient may live another 20 years. Mm -hmm. So we're in that situation that the Earth kind of has cancer. We have to accept the fact that it's bad and it will get worse, but, the, but, the, but we have to come in with the therapy now to stop it getting worse. Uh, it will get worse, we know that, but to mitigate... I agree. Uh, and, and I want to make one other very important point, that we see a lot of refugees now. You know, they're drowning in the Mediterranean and they're trying to get to Italy and all sorts of places. We ain't seen nothing yet. There are going to be millions of ecological refugees as the oceans rise. Mm -hmm. And in Australia, we've got a huge country. We're blocking them out. Blo that people are drowning at sea because we're cruel and we're violating the, uh, the refuge... The, humanitarian United Nations refugee charter. How dare we do that? So you have to look also at psychology and human behavior and how politicians think. And remember that most politicians are scientifically and medically illiterate. Therefore, we have to become literate. And it's, it's easy enough to do if we want to. And remember your children. Remember your children. You've got a 15-year-old daughter. I'm glad I'm nearly 77 because I'll be dead soon. And we've lived the best, we've had the best years of our lives. I don't want to face this. Yet I feel so desperate as a pediatrician for all the children of the earth, let alone the lions and tigers and kangaroos and wombats and emus. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about God's creation. I don't believe in God, but a lot of people do. But the Pope does, and the Pope's really starting to talk about it. So... Apart from his attitude towards women, he's pretty good on most things, this Pope. <laughs> we, I, it, I'm okay. sorry. Go ahead. I sorry. just wanted to pick up on something Helen said about uh, our children. Uh, one of the, you run into a lot of um, politicization in this conversation about climate, which is unfortunate because science is apolitical. It's just the facts. Yeah. But, but this is the way it's, it's, it's come about, at least uh, most, most so in the United States, where uh, basically if you're uh, a blue voter, you... Uh, you know, support changing our energy mix and everything else. And if you're a red voter, you're, you think it's all a conspiracy or um, that it's not happening or it's not a problem or whatever. But um, it's very hard to get uh, those people, those sets of people to agree on something, much of anything. Um, but it doesn't really matter what party you vote for or what church you go to or synagogue or temple or mosque or if you don't go at all, if you don't believe in God, whatever. There's something that we all agree on, or at least I hope we all agree on which is that we want our children's lives to be better than our own, or at least as good as our own. And that is a future that is at risk. 